Welcome to the interview. And what we're looking for is information on how to improve our lives through a better diet. And as importantly, how we, how we change the climate. And I have a very special guest with me. I met him in, in uh, about January of 2006 through his National Geographic article, where he talked about uh, people in blue zones who lived an extraordinary life. And uh, it, what followed was an article that I wrote on, on aging. Uh, gracefully. And uh, I've gotten to know this author, this, uh, uh, this videographer, I guess you would say, uh, certainly a creative person over the years. And I'd like to introduce you to Dan Butner. He has a new book out. It's called Blue Zones Challenge. And we're going to learn about that today, too. So welcome to the show, Dan. I'm, did, did I have Good it about right? It was it 2006 you published that article? Uh, 2005, the article went out. In 2008, I wrote the first book. Yeah. But yeah, it's your direction. We probably met in 2006. So yeah, yeah it's been 15 years. It feels well, like just <laughs> yesterday. It does, doesn't it? Well, you, you made a big, big impression on me, to say the least. Why, why did you, how'd you get started in this? Why, why would you be interested in, you know, this particular topic of populations of people that uh, live to be 100? Anything special except you wanted to be, live to be 100? No, and it's probably not why most people thought. I mean, I was working for National Geographic and uh, leading expeditions. I led about 16 expeditions before the Blue Zones expedition, but they always involved solving mysteries, solving anthropological mysteries by um, ba basically pooling the expertise from, the, from top scientists and then layering on the, the wisdom of the crowd. And we got very good with uh, creating collaboratives between academics and enormous online audiences in intelligent ways. And the previous expedition sought to unravel the why the ancient Maya civilization collapsed, the Anasazi disappearance, the origins of the human species, the origins of the Western civilization. Um, we followed Marco Polo's route across China and we uh, argued, I believe, persuasively that Marco Polo never got to China. Uh, it was until 1999, after about 10 years of these expeditions, that I uh, stumbled upon a World Health Organization uh, uh, study that uh, showed that Okinawans had the longest disability-free life expectancy in the world. And I knew enough that Okinawa was a heterogeneous population so in other words, a, a, a um, melting pot of, of ethnicities. So I knew they weren't genetically superior than the rest of us. And so I reasoned that they must be doing something that gives them an extra 10 or so years of, of, of life free of chronic disease. And that struck me as just a very relevant and important mysteries. And, and um, uh, did a cursory expedition there, came back with strong enough findings that I was able to get funding from the National Institutes on Aging uh, to hire a team of demographers to fan out across the globe and look for other longevity hotspots, which we subsequently named Blue Zones. And, um, and, and once we found them, National Geographic gave me a grant and a, a big magazine assignment to um, officially identify them, verify them, and then start to tease out the correlates or the common denominators in all five of these disparate areas around the world where people are living longest. Any particular reason you call it the blue zone? <laughs> I, I, I met a researcher on my travels uh, named Gianni Pess. And when he was working in, uh, in Sardinia completely independently, um, he was, fanatic about centenarians and he had done the local uh, demography identifying centen where centenarians were living in and uh, he had a big map on his wall and wherever he found the centenarian he made a, a little blue check mark and in the Noural province high in the mountains of Sardinia there were so many blue check marks it just made a blue cloud and he referred to that area as the blue zone just because of the concentration of centenarians and then I evolved the term to uh, now it's, you know, you can Wikipedia, it's a place in the world where people live statistically longest. 
And what are the characteristics? Well, what are the, what are the populations you've identified so far? There were originally what six or eight, and you were probably up to a few. No, there's only five of them, and there may be a sixth, but I doubt there's any more. Okay. Um, Okinawa, Japan has well traditionally had the longest of women. Uh, Sardinia, Italy, longest of men. The island of Ikaria, Greece. They're living about eight years longer than Americans, but largely without dementia, which is extraordinary. Uh, the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica has half the rate of middle-aged mortality that we do in the United States. And they achieved that spending one fifteenth the amount we do on healthcare. And then uh, among the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, we focused in and around Loma Linda, California, because there's a very high concentration of Adventists there. And they're living seven to 10 years longer than other Americans um, and living among us. So as, because only about 20% of how long you live is genes, uh, the other 80% is something else. And if you find the places who've achieved the outcomes we want, uh, we've been arguing that you can reverse engineer what they've done and, and um, you know, put it to work in our lives and, and hence the series of Blue Zones books. You know, the, uh, it sounds like you have a fondness for the Seventh-day Adventists and I know a lot of people from the Adventist community and they particularly like you. As a matter of fact, I think that you guys uh, may have had some closer relationship recently. Did that work out? In yes, I, I, ended up, I ended up selling Blue Zones to the Adventists. It's not the church. They, they, they uh, run an enormous hospital system up and down the west coast of the United States, 26 hospitals. They're very disciplined operators. Uh, we share values when it comes to what the... Uh, path to preventative health is, namely in eating a plant-based diet. And, um, you know, I, Blue Zones got too big for me to manage. Yeah, I like researching and writing and exploring. And uh, I was spending all my time running. I had 200 employees, and just wasn't, wasn't my sweet spot. So uh, partnering with the Adventists was that, uh, the, the right choice. Very are, happy. They moving, are they moving forward on your work in a good way? Yeah, they are. They really are. They're, I mean, they have the resources to scale it. We're in 60 communities. You know, just a word on the work we do. The central insight in Blue Zones was that people there possess no greater self-control, no greater discipline. They have no better sense of individual responsibility. They're not better educated. Um, they simply live in environments where the healthy choice is easier or unavoidable. And um, my thesis throughout is if you want to get people to be healthier or live longer, don't try to get them to change their behavior because all but single digit percentile people that will, will forget about it or they'll fall off the wagon with, with in a year or two. Whereas if you can shape people's environments, you can get, uh, you can get subconscious um, change for decades at a time. And as you well know, John, when it comes to longevity or, or lasting health, there's no short-term fix other than not dying. In other words, there's almost nothing you can do this month or this year that's going to add time at the end of your life. Uh, you need to think about things that you're willing and able to do uh, for decades or a lifetime you know, which is where diet comes in, which is where movement comes in. You know, these people think, well, I'm going to do CrossFit for a year or, or you know, run a marathon this year and think it's going to add years to your life. It doesn't, you know, you have to do it for a long time. So our approach at changing environments has been enormously successful. We get hired by entire cities to come in with a team that changes the defaults and the, and the nudges at the population level, usually through policy and design change of all the buildings. And we get paid when we lower the BMI of the city health uh, insurance companies pay us for lowering BMI at the population level. If you lower the BMI, um, the lower rates of diabetes and heart disease and several types of cancers uh, follow. So therein lies the value we can bring in. Uh, it is all rooted in the observations we made in places like Okinawa and, and Sardinia. Well, can you, can you give us an example of, uh, of a community that you've made a big difference in that's been very appreciative of your work? We came into Fort Worth, Texas, I think in 2013, 
Uh, within five years, when the rest of Texas saw increasing obesity rates, we lowered their BMI at the population level by 4%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that according to Gallup, it occasioned about $250 million per year in healthcare cost savings because people aren't um, getting as many heart attacks and developing as much diabetes. You know, a heart attack on average costs somebody $120,000. So in a population of a million people, our work occasioned about uh, 19,000 fewer heart attacks at $120,000 a piece that very quickly adds up to significant savings. Can you, can you tell us, Dan, what the, the qualities of the blue zone people have in terms of what, what do you think really makes a difference as far as their longevity goes? You know, I have my biases, but I'd like to yeah. hear from you first. Well, you know, just full disclosure, we share the exact same bias that you, you developed your bias through uh, 40 or 50 years of medical research and practice. And, and uh, I, I've achieved it by, by observing the, the statistically longest of people. But they are eating a mostly whole food plant-based diet, 90 to 100%. Um, the five pillars of every uh, diet of longevity in the world are whole grains, beans, corn, uh, and wheat, I'm sorry, rice, corn, and wheat, but whole grain. Not, not the stripped down version. Greens, probably 60 or 70 kinds of greens. Tubers, uh, including sweet potatoes and regular potatoes. Nuts. And then I believe the cornerstone of the pillar of all longevity diets in the world are beans. Um, they have strategies or they have an environment that, that helps keep them from overeating. Um, they, they have vocabulary for purpose, which is worth about eight years of life expectancy over being rudderless. They tend to belong to a faith, and the faith is often a proxy just for a good social network or less likely to engage in risky behaviors. Uh, they move naturally. Not, oddly enough, and this is disruptive, uh, none of them exercise in the way we think of exercise. They don't belong to go to yoga classes, do CrossFit, or but they live in environments that require them to move every 20 minutes or so. So every time they go to work or a friend's house or out to eat, it occasions a walk. They have gardens out back that uh, they, they uh, tend into their hundreds in many cases. And their houses aren't full of mechanical convenience to do work for them. They're still doing yard work by hand and kneading bread by hand and doing housework. And, and that adds up over time. So, uh, you know, we're big believers in Blue Zone that yeah, if you want to get a population to move more, shape their environment. So they're walking places instead of driving every place. Well, let's move back to Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, what were the major things that you did that made a difference that dropped the BMI of these people in this particular city? Where, where, where did you put your efforts? Uh, because it sounds to me like some of the things would be hard to do change their social behavior. And some things would be a little easier to do with changes in their, their dietary behaviors. What, what, did, what did you, I mean, what were your greatest tools to make a difference? Where do you put your effort? Yes. So I often think um, people look for a silver bullet. We don't think in th terms of silver bullet. We think in terms of silver buckshot. So we're, we aim to unleash 70 or 80 um, initiatives interventions at the population level. So uh, some of the things that worked in, um, there were lots of um, uh, food deserts in Fort Worth. We managed to convince these bodegas or these uh, convenience stores to put in, well, we helped finance it actually, uh, coolers so that they could offer fruits and vegetables in the poorest neighborhoods. Um, we got about 500 uh, restaurants to uh, become Blue Zone certified, which meant, meant that they had at least three plant-based offerings. And you didn't automatically get refills of sodas. You had to buy refills. That drove down the soda consumption. You didn't automatically have bread delivered to your table. You had to ask for the bread. The um, adjectives on the menu um, promoted the healthier foods rather than the, the foods that had the biggest profit margin necessarily. Uh, at the, at the um, 
At the policy level, we got them to adopt an active living policy where every new street had to be asked, had to be assessed for bike lane, sidewalks, trees, and um, narrow lanes to encourage more walkability. We, uh, we put in several hundred miles of bike lanes. So all of a sudden, for a lot of people, it was easier just to walk or bike to work or a friend's house rather than get in their car. Um, we had uh, 200 or so workplaces that, who changed their designs and their policies to nudge people into moving more, consuming less junk, becoming more plant slant, socializing more, and knowing and, and uh, living their purpose. In the schools, uh, they changed policies so there's no eating in hallways and classrooms. Uh, so that engineers out about eight hours of junk food eating, even though it's very hard to change school lunches because of USDA funding for school lunches and the food that your schools are required to serve. We were able to change uh, the way the lunchroom was set up so that fruits and vegetables were put at the beginning of the line. Uh, and that little change, uh, can, because they're picking that up first, there's more fruits and vegetables on a kid's plate and they eat more. Um, so again, it's it's mostly behavioral economics and changing environment rather than trying to trying to do the the, the heavy handed um, trying to convince people to remember how to eat or to, to get their exercise every day. Any, any nutritional cooking classes? Did you get any restaurants to put uh, blues on uh, blues on menus? Uh... Yeah, we 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 had five hundred. We got five hundred uh, blue zone certified. Um, restaurants throughout Fort Worth. And again, to get certification, they didn't have to be 100% whole. They just had to have at least three plant-based offerings. Uh, we come to them with a menu with about 30 ways. Every time you go out to eat in America, uh, on average, you consume about 300 more calories than you would if you stayed at home. And those calories tend to be more sodium-laden, more you know, they're almost all these animal products, uh, saturated fat. Uh, so, you know, you're never going to get a restaurant to, to, to go 100% whole food plant. -based. I mean, almost never. Uh, but you can get them to add three or four plant-based entrees. And you know, we also got about 15% of Fort Worth population to take a Blue Zone pledge, wherein they agreed to try to eat more plant-based uh, to build their social network, their immediate social circle. So that was healthier to take a purpose workshop and volunteer or otherwise put their purpose to work. But, you know, in this process, that 15% of Fort Worth adults, they were seeking places where they could eat Blue Zones food. And uh, we made sure that they were aware of the 500 or so Blue Zone certified restaurants where they could, you know, even though often it was a steakhouse, there was a portobello mushroom offering. Um, so, um, you know, this is this battle that we're waging in this country, the $3.7 trillion healthcare bill we spend every year on largely avoidable disease is not, not gonna be one with a hammer. It's gonna be one with dental tools. It's gonna be, um, uh, a game of inches to use a sports metaphor. And at least uh, at least we're proving that that approach can work. Well, that's been my experience to any restaurant that tried to serve all vegan food quickly went out of business uh, because the public just doesn't seem to be ready for this, uh, you know, this kind of change. Your new book, uh, Blue Zones Challenge, uh, where, where does that, where does that take the reader and the person interested in improving their life? What, what kind of, uh, of new ideas do you have you brought out in this new book? So the central premise of the city work is don't try to change people's behavior, change their surroundings. So the Blue Zone Challenge takes four weeks. We ask people to go 100% whole food plant-based for four weeks, as much as they can. We gamify it. They get points for the closer they get to it. So it's fun. And people who manage to get close to that whole plant-based diet, we know that within just a couple of days, their, their minds are sharper, their digestive system moves more smoothly. They tend to have more energy. Um, people with skin problems, their skin tends to clear up after just a couple, two or three weeks. Uh, within just three weeks, 
of going a whole food plant-based, your mortality rate drops by about 10%. And then after about four weeks or four weeks, we had 1,100 people from the Adventist Health System, employees take the Blue Zone Challenge. And even though this wasn't a weight loss program, we saw four pounds on average, a self-report of these 1,100 people, they lost four pounds over that four weeks. And we achieved that not by asking them to uh, muster Herculean um, discipline and self-control, but just to ease into eating whole food plant-based. Um, mostly what we do is we show them how to set up their kitchen, their bedroom, the rest of their home, their workplace, their social life, and to a certain extent, their internal uh, life so that the healthy choice is the easy choice. And we use that, we do that by marshalling it in science, uh, other nudges and defaults, evidence-based nudges, nudges and defaults, uh, sort of surround sound your whole life. So the healthy choice becomes unconscious. According to the Cornell Food Lab, we make about 220 food choices a day. It's like, am I going to put salt on my food or hot sauce? Am I going to have water with dinner or Diet Coke? Am I going to eat the last bite or let it go? Am I going to have dessert? Am I going to take a sip of this or not drink anything? So only about 15 or 20% of those decisions are conscious decisions. So even if, even if I got you to adhere to the best diet in the world, um, I'm only engineering 20% of your choices. What we try to do in the Blue Zone Challenge is engineer those unconscious decisions so they're mindlessly better. And because these are long-term um, setups, long-term environmental changes, they can last for years or decades. And it's in that uh, pursuit, uh, that sort of long-term uh, influence that makes the difference in, in really how long and how well you're going to live. How about support from the medical community? If they, uh, they enrolled in your philosophies, uh, do, your, do the participants um, have uh, oversight from competent doctors that know how to change medications when people change their diet. Because, you know, you know my experience, uh, Dan, is uh, <clears throat> that when people change their diet, we're able to get 90% of them to reduce or stop their medications. So I'm talking to Dan Butner. Uh, he's the, uh, the founder and author of The Blue Zones and has a new book out called The Blue Zones Challenge. And we're gonna get into some, some other issues here in the next few minutes. Uh, I want to hear about the medical doctors, the physicians, the scientific support, all of my colleagues. Yeah, well, I, I guess the good news is that many of our cities have been funded by hospital systems. Texas Health Resources uh, has been really uh, forward. Naples Community Hospital funded the, the program uh, in Naples. The problem with the health uh, the economics of healthcare in this country, they only get paid when you get sick, uh, for the most part. When you think about it, pharmaceutical companies, they make the vast majority of the money when a doctor, when you have a problem and a doctor writes a prescription. Uh, as you know, doctors mostly get paid for procedures and visits and, and um, uh, the, the uh, hospitals mostly get paid when you come in and rent a, rent a bed and and by their services. It's very hard. The economics of healthcare in this country uh, aren't all that interested in keeping you healthy. Um, so no, we don't have much support from uh, doctors. Uh, there's some notable exceptions. The F Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, Neil Barnard and his group, they've really woken up and smelled the cappuccino. They're, they're training doctors on how to um, uh, treat people with whole plant-based uh, diets, and and we have a really nice connection and a lot. But but um, you know, doctors, to their credit, and, and you may be able to correct me on this, John. Uh, they really aren't taught in medical school uh, about nutrition as much as they are taught about how to fix a problem after it's already happened. You know, I I could go further than that, Dan. I tell you that they get no practical education on how to treat people with diet which is called diet therapy. You know, it's a, a way of practice that has been used for hundreds of years. And up until recently, uh, it was uh, very much in vogue by Walter Kempner and Nathan Pritikin and many other pioneers. But 
you know, with the with the advent of industry, with the, uh, the focus on profits, the idea of changing your diet to solve your problems, even though diet is the cause of their problems, has not been very popular. And most of my colleagues are still living in the dark ages. They're still tied to, well, they make a lot of money too. It's not just the drug companies that make money from sickness. You know, your physicians, your hospitals, uh, they make money from sick people. So it's been a, a really tough sell, but as we've talked about before, is some of these people go through dramatic changes and they're able to stop all their diabetic medications, all their blood pressure pills and so on. I, I certainly hope that someday you're able to incorporate some medical supervision for these people because uh, well, not only could they get into trouble if they continue the medications when they get well, but it would be nice if they had support and they were told that they, they're doing the right thing. And that comes from a medical doctor. That really does. People trust doctors, and and um, you know we've uh, we've had pushback from doctors too, and and um, it, it would be great if, but do doctors don't have much incentive to talk people into eating. I mean, it just doesn't figure in. They got to make a living, right? And how do they make a living? Um, Try getting involved with people, what people eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right. Yeah, that's the way it is. It's a seven-minute office visit, and it's closed by handing the patient a prescription. You know, yeah. that's all so you've been it. a real, you've been a pioneer. I mean, if, if America was full of doctors like you, we'd have a, a, a tenth of the chronic disease that we're suffering. Yeah, we'd probably have a revolution too. Uh, you know, uh, so you, you've, you've accomplished- I'll lead it. We need a revolution, absolutely. A good one. <laughs> Over the last 16 years, you've uh, really made a, a name for yourself and you're you know, you put the idea that people can make a difference in their lives. And of course, when we, you and I talk, I always, I always bring the, uh, the discussion around to changing the food. I know there are many important things like exercise and uh, social well-being. I, I, I don't deny these things, just that my, my focus is on food. And uh, we had a chat conversation. I remember we had a breakfast one time at uh, one of my advanced study weekends. And what I suggested to you, and I hope I, I made an impression on you, was that what ha these populations had in common is they ate starch. In fact, you said it, grains and legumes. I mean, these are starches. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm involved in and I'd like to spend a few minutes on this if we can, Dan. Uh, as a grandfather, uh, seven grandkids, uh, as, as a doctor who's uh, spent the last 46 years uh, treating thousands of people and exposing the uh, the medical profession to some some ideas that have been around for a while that I happen to profess. Uh, about uh, about 17 years ago, the first grandchild was born, and I realized that we have another problem that we need to deal with, and that's that's saving the planet. And uh, you you probably heard the statements that over half the greenhouse gases are due to the an animal agriculture business and. You may not have heard, but I'd like to tell you that uh, estimates are that overnight, you can reduce your greenhouse gas emissions personally overnight by about 80% with a change from the typical American diet to a, a, a they talk about a vegan diet. So uh, I don't talk about a vegan diet, Dan. I, I tell you, it's different than when we were together in person. Uh, I don't talk about the McDougal diet. I don't talk about a vegan diet. I'll tell you what I talk about. I talk about a traditional diet, uh, a diet that most populations, as you've discovered in your modern research, most populations have consumed. 99.9% .9 of the people around the earth have consumed them. There is a, uh, there's a coin dollar uh, that I used to pass out to people, but I, but I kind of lost track of. I just ordered some new ones. It's called the Three Sisters. And the three sisters represent the uh, traditional Native Americans who lived on a diet of beans, uh, squash, and corn. And wherever you go around the world, uh, Asia, it's, it's rice that's a starch. And the Middle East used to be known as the breadbasket of the world. And the Incas lived on potatoes. And the Aztecs and the Mayans, they lived on corn. It, you know, they're, they're all starch-based diets. So what I've, hopefully, I've become less offensive what I've decided to do is talk more in terms of what you've known for a long time. These are traditional diets that people have lost sight of. They really are. And, you know, somewhere along the lines, the paleo people have hijacked 
the traditional diet with this this um, nonsense that you know we were killing a bison and eating that every day. Um, you know, as far as to the extent we can piece together the paleo diet, it was probably mostly gathered foods like roots and you know, berries and nuts and things you could get most of. May occasionally there'd be a kill, but um, that wasn't around for long because you couldn't refrigerate it. So um, they were also largely plant-based. And to your point, in blue zones, they were eating a traditional diet and it was mostly peasant food. It was mostly the cheap food you find at the bottom uh, shelves of your grocery store that cost you two bucks a pound. And uh, all it takes is a little ingenuity to make it taste delicious. And man, you, you have, uh, you can replace um, hospitals and pills and, and uh, um, battle of the bulge and being sick. Yeah, you know, battle of the bulge. Yeah, it, it's the food. The hunter gatherer uh, idea about how people were mostly hunters is due to sexism, uh, gender bias. Uh, the men went out and hunted, and as you say, they didn't have refrigeration and they weren't all that good at hunting. And uh, who stayed home and gathered the food were the grandparents, the children, you know, the women. And so it's just another example of, uh, of sexism, gender bias, and unfortunately it lives yeah, on. It's not the truth. The truth is, is that the bulk of the foods, except for the extremes of environment, came, uh, came from starchy grains, starchy legumes, starchy underground vegetables, roots, tubes, and so on. And, you know, that's the basic truth. Okay, so I was trying to lead you into, you know, you've helped communities. You've just done a tremendous job at waking people up. Everybody knows the blue zones. Every, you know, I don't think there's a, you know, there's, there's really a, a, a person who's well aware of what's going on and interested in diet at all that hasn't heard of your work and isn't, doesn't admire you and wants to be, live to be a hundred. But do, do you see this, you know, we got 7 billion people on this planet. We're in big trouble in terms of the environment. Do you see how the things that you've learned over the last 20 years or so might be applied to universal dietary change? How are we gonna get the bulk of the population to start eating like your populations in the blue zones? Tell me how to slow Tell me how to slow global warming to, to mitigate climate change. Come on, Dan, I need to know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that uh, the Blue Zone's way of living, uh, they walk everywhere. They're, 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 it's not a crush of cars. They, they eat low on the food chain. Um, their houses aren't full of electronic gadgets. They're living close to home. They're growing much of their own food. Uh, they probably have one-tenth the the uh, uh, footprint that, that we're having. When it, you know, when it gets, when it comes to getting people to eat a whole food plant-based diet, you can try to hound them or guilt them all day long about global warming or cruelty to animals. Some people care about that or uh, not developing heart disease or diabetes in a few decades. But what people really care about is lunch you know, what, what they're going to eat and their next meal, what's sitting in front of them. So I hate to say it, the, the best way to evangelize people is with taste. Uh, if we could take the, the culinary expertise we're currently now pouring into bone broth and, and, and pork belly and all these meaty, uh, you know, you look at a menu at an expensive restaurant and all that effort is usually put into some animal. Uh, dead animal. If we took that same culinary genius and unleashed it on uh, peasant food, whole grains and beans, especially blue zones, they know how to make beans taste delicious. We could have a revolution. And this isn't pie in the sky stuff. In Miami here where I'm right now, there's a restaurant called Love Life Cafe, 100% vegan. It's packed. Uh, in Los Angeles, you have Crossroads or Gracias Madre or Cafe Gratitude which are some of the finest chefs in the world, Matthew Kinney, some of the finest chefs in the world who unleashed their genius on plant-based food. And I can tell you from having uh, taken meat eaters to uh, dinner at these places, nobody misses the dead animal at the middle of the plate. And uh, I, I just think the best, the best thing we can do is, is, um, uh, is harness or, or uh, aggregate harness and promote the best tasting 
recipes. And uh, um, I think there's a wonderful opportunity for uh, marketers out there. You know, we are, believe it or not, we're trending more plant-based. My generation, baby boomers, 3% self-described as vegetarian. We're up to over 10% among the Gen Xers. So the good news is the younger generations, they care more, they're more aware, and they're in a position where their tastes can be shaped um, and just a better position than people our age. Well, I, I, li I like the idea of making people uh, enjoy the food. Uh, of course, you have the problem of getting them exposed to it. And so many folks are, are habituated, or addicted, or whatever you want to call it, to the salt, the fat, and the sugar, and, and the animal foods. Uh, but but as, as I'm sure you're well aware, you know, nobody will eat boiled chicken or, uh, you know, baked beef. They, they have to throw a, a barbecue sauce over the top to get it down. And, and of course, that gets back to salt, sugar, and spice. Uh, and you could easily put that over your potatoes or your rice or corn. So you and I know that, uh, that the taste is there in terms of our type of eating. It's just how do we get the rest of the public to realize this? How, how do we, you know, what do we do, Dan, to, to make people notice what you and I have been doing and several other people around the world have been doing to try and bring awareness to, first of all, you know, I spent 46 years to awareness about how to prevent and to cure chronic diseases due to eating like a king and a queen. All right, you know, I spent, I spent 46 years doing that. And, uh, you know, now I'm at a point where the next challenge for me is to, instead of to practicing diet therapy for patients, which is what I call my practice, diet therapy for patients. You know, I haven't taken on a new patient and that's, uh, that's diet therapy for planet earth. You know, I, yeah, I, well, I, I, I'd like to just pause for a second. You're, you, 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 you're spending a lot of effort in uh, identifying the problem, but I, I like to just celebrate the work you've already done. I, I know so many people whose lives have been transformed by your study weekends and your immersion programs. And you, you probably don't realize the enormous impact that you've had. You've influenced me and, um, you know, the, the people come and they, they, they have the epiphany with you and they spread it to their families and they spread it to your friends. So you probably had more impact than any other individual uh, living in America and, and getting people to go black pace and have an understanding. So, you know, I, I think you can, you can take a moment to, to uh, celebrate yourself um, before we look at the next, the next challenge. And you're, you're quite right. Uh, I know you've made some really delicious plant-based foods that you've, you could buy commercially. I think they were soups and so forth. I, I think that's the right idea. It's, it's still, uh, it, there were in 8,000 stores across the country. It's called That's Dr. McDougall's. significant. Yeah. Dr. McDougall's Right Foods, there are about, uh, about 30 SKUs, and they're mostly soups and meals. And boy, they've been really, really popular. We developed that, uh, that company in the early 90s, and it's just, it's huge. So I, you know, I do see, I do see that, uh, that people enjoy tasty food, and it's called Dr. Yes. McDougall's Right Foods. But uh, OK. I, 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 I'm going to push you a little bit. I just want to know from all the things you've learned, you know, the populations of people, how do we take 80% of the people in this country and probably Europe are overweight and they're heading towards 40 and 50% being obese and they eat at fast food restaurants and they will never give up their meat, they so to say. How do we, how do we convince them or at least some way or another to get them, even if we have to force them I don't know, how do we get them to change to a traditional diet that you have spent so much time telling people would be to their advantage based upon the blue zones? Give me, a, give me, give me that magic bullet, Dan. No, I'll give you the, I'll give you the magic uh, buckshot and we've done it. I mean, if, if you're looking for the one thing, you're not going to find it. But when you, when you, um, work with city, especially municipal governments, because they can get things done fast. There, there are a dozen things a city government can do to make favor plant-based healthy food over fast junk food. Um, 
So we come into cities with what we call policy menus. We actually have about 30 evidence-based policies on that menu that will convert people from the junkier food to the healthier food. And we don't tell the city they have to do any one of them, but we do offer certification if they can pass eight of them. And then uh, you methodically over time visit every single restaurant and offer them, uh, you know, we offer them Blue Zone certification. They're not going to go 100% vegan, but we can get them 30% there. And then you go into the schools and you offer them, you know, in our case, Blue Zone certification for, to favor the plant healthy food over the junk food. So you don't get them all the way here, but you get them there. And we go into the grocery stores. And by the way, grocers, the next to soda pops, the second biggest profit uh, um, margin they have on any products is in the produce aisle. So they love it when we come in with the program that helps them uh, uh, make produce front and center um, and favoring. Uh, and then you go to the employers and uh, we offer Blue Zone certification for employers to get rid of sodas out of the vending machine and that uh, offer plant-based offerings uh, and competitively price them. Uh, we've had several employers you know, if they took all the meat off of their menu, there'd be a, a, a mutiny. But what they do, what we got them to do is raise the price of the meat offer and then make a Blue Zones plant-based offer and lower that price. So price sensitive people then go towards the plant-based. So you start to see how you, you just, you don't try to do, you don't try to um, silver bullet it with just one group of people, you just, surround sound people with the gentle nudges and environmental tweaks that make it easier for them. And I still think the idea that you have with the Dr. McDougall food is the right idea that, that can continue that, but it has to be a maniacal focus on taste. Um, and you, you know, I know you're a big fan of low oil. Um, you know, the, I think perhaps the only divergence in what you found and what we found, we actually found that uh, follow-up study in Icaria that for people over 60, uh, the highest olive oil consumption had the lowest mortality rate. Now, I know there's, I mean, there's lots of debate on that, but I will tell you that if you can deploy some oil, some plant-based oil in food, it's often easier to segue the meat eaters off of their off of their meaty diet and onto a plant-based diet if it's got that richness that that fats convey. Now, I'm talking to Dan Butner, and his new book is uh, Blue Zones Challenge. And, and right. it's what people want to buy because it offers them an opportunity to take on a four-week challenge to improve their lives. And, you know, just opening people's eyes is the first step that we have to do. And, you know, those who really like themselves, uh, who have... Uh, you know, an interest in a good life, they're, they're going to pick it up and run with it. So regardless of how we open their eyes, I think it's really important. Let, let me tell you exactly what I'd recommend for anybody listening right now who'd like to take a plant-based journey. The first thing you do is you get your hands on some good plant-based cookbooks. And I know, John, you have several, uh, Michael Greger does. What are yours again? Well, we have, the, we have several, there. McDougall, they're all under the name McDougal, uh, yeah. McDougal cookbook. And we have an app too. We have an app with a thousand recipes for people. And of course, ours are all based on starches uh, with fruits and vegetables, all vegan, very low oil. But what you do is, you know, you talk about taste. Uh, where I run into conflict with some of my colleagues is the salt, sugar, and spice issue. Uh, they don't want to give people salt and sugar. Well, I want to tell you, if you don't give them salt and sugar, they're yeah. not going to eat the food. They're yeah. going to eat it. They're not going to eat it. And, and, you know, I just want people to eat the food because they'll get well. They'll lower their environmental impact. And if I have to throw a little salt on top of the, on top of the potatoes or I have to throw a little brown sugar on top of the oatmeal, that's a small price to pay. I couldn't agree more. So they... I think the journey starts by getting your hand on some good cookbooks. I have one, the Blue Zones Kitchen, and page through it with your family and identify a half a, half a dozen plant-based. And for New Year's resolution, instead of getting on the new fad diet this year, tell yourself you're going to cook a half a dozen 
new plant-based recipes that you think your family's going to like. Because once you, A, learn how to make it, establish that you have the tools to make it, but the big one is knowing that you're going to like it. I don't have to come back and tell you it's good for the planet or it's good for your heart or reduces animal cruelty. You're going to eat it the other way. The second big thing you can do is think about upgrading your immediate social circle. We know that if your three best friends are obese and unhealthy, there's a 150% better chance that you'll be overweight. And, you know, my grandma used to say, show me your friends, Dan, and I'll tell you your future. So by adding a Dan Buettner or John McDougall to your immediate social circle, or just another vegan or vegetarian, because we're going to do a few things. Number one, when we go out, when we meet to go out to eat, we're going to show you the best plant, the best tasting plant-based food in restaurants. Uh, when you come over to our house, we're going to serve you delicious plant-based food. And when we come to your house, we're going to expect you to serve us plant-based food. So you're going to learn the skills and it's, the influence of our social circle that has an ongoing and measurable impact on our health behaviors. So learning those restaurant recipes that you love and, and rebuilding your social circle around eating more plant-based are the two, I believe, best and lasting strategies to, to segue your diet from junk to, um, to jazz. I, I would like to add to that, Dan, and that is you don't put vegan chocolate chip ice cream in the refrigerator. You know, it's just not a matter, you gotta get rid of the old stuff that, that has been engineered to, to make you be bad. Oh yeah. You know, so yes. it, it's a commitment. Once people decide that they want a better life and they learn the tools from you and myself or several other people out there who are teaching the truth about diet, then they have to say, look, I've had enough, right? you know, just like the day I quit smoking, October 20th, 1972, I said, I just don't want to do this anymore. And believe you know, me, I, I work every day to, to, to keep free of that habit, the addiction. I, you know, I, I still haven't started. I haven't, haven't gotten around to it yet. I'm sorry, Dan, you said what? I, I haven't started smoking yet. I just haven't gotten around to it. Okay, well. Well, I, I, was, uh, I was raised in a smoking family, so it was easy for me to, to learn some bad habits. But, you know, it's, the point is, is that these, these things are so attractive. Alcohol to the alcoholic, uh, tobacco to the, uh, to the tobacco addict. You know, that, that, uh, that vegan ice cream to too many people, they're just so attractive. That, that people need to make a, a serious decision that I want to be different, and then it's easy. You know, it's nice to have some some really tasty foods, but you got to get the bad guys out of the house too. Yeah. So in the blue zone uh, challenge, you know, it's all about setting up your kitchen. So, you know, I like to say we're we're on, most of us are on a seafood diet. We eat the food we see, and it's it's very hard to talk people into not bringing any junk food into their house. You know, we have this thing: the four foods to never bring in your house processed meats, salty snacks, packaged sweets, and soda pop. Uh, those are the worst offenders in my opinion. The foods that you should always have in your house, I argue, are nuts, great snack, beans of all kinds, uh, your favorite fruit, I know there's some fruits better than others, and sweet potatoes, because sweet potatoes are cheap and easy to make taste delicious. Um, and then if you're gonna bring junk, don't put it on your counter. Establish a junk food drawer that's out of the way. Um, instead of having a, a toaster on your kitchen, which research shows that people with the toaster on their kitchen counter, they're often prompted to put unhealthy food. There's very few healthy things we put into a toaster. Um, so instead of a toaster and a bag of chips on the counter, uh, have a fruit bowl because that prompts us to eat fruit when we walk through. Uh, take the TV out of the kitchen. Uh, research shows that we tend to eat to our favorite TV shows, missing the sort of biological prompts of feeling full or satiated uh, when we're distracted by TV. So, you know, in addition to making some of these dietary su suggestions that both, you know, you and I, John, are on the exact same page about, um, we help you set up your uh, kitchen so the unconscious decisions are 10 or 20 percent better. And that helps get us in the right direction. The name of the book is uh, Blue, Zones, Blue Zones Challenge. 
And Dan Butner is the founder of the Blue Zones and has made a huge, a huge impression all over the world. But Dan, from your point of view, and maybe from your personal life, where do you see the next, next 10, 20 years happening in terms of uh, the world diet, in terms of people becoming aware, in terms of uh, changing things around, such as uh, the warming of the planet? Uh, do you, do you, uh, are you pessimistic, optimistic? Do you, you think you have a, something to contribute to make sure that turn, things turn out right? You know, I, I know sort of what people hope for is some great optimistic um, uh, statement here, but no, <laughs> I, 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 I spent 10 years studying collapse as a civilization and the pattern for the human species has always been uh, innovation uh, creates a huge uh, sur surfeit or, or uh, excess supply um, of usually food population grows. Uh, there tends to be an elite class that uh, uh, forgets about the poor class and that uh, sows the seeds of revolution. And uh, it's often a, uh, a, a exhaustion of the carrying capacity of land and the civilization uh, collapses, the population corrects down, and then we start all over again. It happened with the Mesopotamians, it happens with the Maya, it happened with the Aztec, um, it's just, I, it, I think probably what's going to happen is, uh, we're not going to, we're not going to react quickly enough with this global warming mess. Uh, it's going to cause massive catastrophe. Uh, the population, uh, numbers will correct in maybe two or three generations. And, um, there won't be as many humans to, to overexploit the, the planet and the planet will then, as it always will, will recuperate just without as many humans. Mm -hmm. I think good souls like you, John, and uh, a, a lot of other environmentalists will, will make their best effort, but I just don't think we have enough, strong enough world leadership to, to make a, enough of a difference um, uh, in, in, at this late date. Well, I, I, I do appreciate what you have to say. And in, in my lowest moments, I agree with you 100%, but I can't live that way, Dan. You know, I've tried, but- Neither can I, but that's- <laughs> like, I, like I said, I have seven grandchildren and I have to I have to put my efforts, my thoughts into any possibility of making a difference. And, you know, I, I see people understanding, people who, you know, drive hybrids, electric cars, recycle, they stop and ask themselves, well, what else can I do? And then they learn that they can cut their greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the change to a diet that you and I believe in. And the other thing that's happening is the food supply. Uh, that's gonna be the next catastrophe on this planet is enough food to feed the population. And you know what? There's gonna be left to eat potatoes, <laughs> rice. You know, that's it. Man. They're, they're, they're not gonna have any choice but to eat the, that kind of food. Uh, cattle are gonna be gone. And so will hopefully chickens. And, you're going to be left with the diet of the people who follow the blue zones and have lived to be over 100 in the traditional populations that you've studied. And they're going to be diets based around the, the food available, which is going to be, like I say, potatoes would be my ideal future planetary food. I'm not going to stop trying, Dan. I, I, and I'm glad that you're in the, the fight too, because- I'm not going to stop trying. I'm just- yeah. I'm just coldly realistic about you it. You are, and you know what? I, I, I think I think you're, you know, I, I don't want to admit it to myself, but I, I think you have a, a good handle on the future. It's doesn't look good. And, uh, but the, you know, the nice thing is, is uh, there are organizations out there like Cambridge from England and that <clears throat> realize that the diet is the one, the one card we haven't played. And uh, people are focusing on automobiles, transportation, energy, solar panels, windmills, etc. But the one card we haven't played is the food. If we could just get the bulk of the population on this planet to understand that the human being is a star cheater. The human being has lived except for in the extremes of environments, in the extremes of cultures, 99.99% of people who ever walked this earth have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch, like corn, rice, potatoes, beans, the foods that you recommend so highly. 
I know I'm, I'm giving too I'm giving too much credit to the human beings' ability to make decisions. And I, yeah, I just don't think at, at dinner time you're going to be able to make the carbon footprint argument when they're they're smelling hamburgers from McDonald's. Most people. Yeah, that's 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 the truth. Is it's uh, you know people people are so habituated. Maybe maybe addiction is the right word too to all the salt, sugar, and fat. And of course that was done on purpose that uh, they don't, you know, I, they just don't see, was there ever a time in your life when that you consumed the rich American diet and, and the idea that you were going to change and give up the, the meats and the chickens and the, I mean, do, do you remember those days when, before you changed how, how difficult it seemed to be for you to possibly live on or live without these, uh, traditional yeah. high protein, high calcium foods. You know, in all honesty, I, I occasionally crave a hamburger, quite honestly. I, I'm off of it now, so I won't, you know, it's just like maybe once in a while you'd like to take smoke a cigarette, but I don't do it because I, I don't want to go down that slope. But um, yeah, I just think the, the, the answer's got to lie in pandering to people's tastes. So we're not going to we're not going to win the battle until we figure out how to make whole food plant based food taste just as good or be vastly cheaper than the the meaty cheesy eggy subs, substitutes and uh, I think we can work in the right direction. I, I just want you to know that personally, I'm there. In other words, uh, you know, I, I love my food and uh, I think it's the tastiest food in the world. And I, I would never go back to things that I used to think were good because they're not. They're just, uh, you know, they're, they're bland tasting or disgusting. You know, Dan, I, I, I had a job once working in the kidney, the, the renal service when I was a uh, medical resident. And one of my tasks was to talk my kidney patients into eating saltless cheese and saltless butter. The next day when I came in to see them, they said, Doc, I just, I'd rather die than eat this. You know, it's the salt, the sugar, the sauces that we put over the top of these unappealing foods like cheese and milk and meat and et cetera, that if we could only get them to understand that all that taste that you're talking about is right at their fingertips. They, they just need a little bit of education, which I know you're doing so well. Getting back to, 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 to some thoughts, the last thought I'd like to uh, you kind of express yourself, but I just, what do you see Dan Butner doing over the next 20 years? And do you see a large, uh, uh, large number of people joining what your efforts are? Or have you just been burnt out? Well, I, other people have always made long-term plans. I've never planned for more than about a year. I have uh, two more books uh, with National Geographic. I'm writing and I'm doing a, a, uh, series for Netflix and wow. that, that's professionally, I'm gonna focus on doing my best job in those two things. And uh, my experience is that there'll be new doors open at the end of those, uh, ends of those paths. And so. Well, they sound like very, very uh, important projects and you're getting the word out. That's, that's really good yeah. to know. And there are a lot, a lot of people who are trying to get the word out, but, I, but we're not gonna so stop. I'm not going to stop trying either. I, I do it out of passion. If, if uh, anybody has other questions for me, I'm at Dan Butner on social media. I'm good at answering people's questions. So feel free to reach out to me directly. And John, it's an honor to see you again and be with you. And you know, if I can ever help, uh, you know how to get a hold of me. And I just think that if America could learn uh, by your example, by your wisdom, It'd be a much better planet, a much lower carbon footprint, a lot less heart disease and cancer and diabetes, and we'd be a lot happier. We would be a blue zone. Yeah, the whole planet. Well, thank you, Dan Butner. The book is the Blue Zones Challenge. I encourage you to buy it. You know, it's a, another tool to to cause you to have a better life, and the ultimate outcome may be that we we do a little good for the planet. I'm Dr. John McDougall. I want to thank you and I want to thank Dan Butner for joining me. Uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, John.